The following program is brought to you by Caltech. I'm Judy Cohen. I'm the chair of the Committee on Institute Programs, and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. But first, let me remind you that our next speaker and the last speaker for this academic year will be Tony Reedhead, uh, who will speak on Wednesday, May 25th, on the quest for inflationary signals in the cosmic microwave <coughs> excuse me, background radiation. Tony has a huge list of titles, which I'll spare you. You can see them on the advertisements, et cetera. And uh, he's a friend of mine, and I'm sure it'll be a very interesting talk. Today's talk is, will be given by the <clears throat> Alan and Lena Bell Davis Professor of Biology, Mary Kennedy, who has a PhD from Johns Hopkins University and did postdoctoral research in molecular neuroscience at Harvard and at Yale Medical Schools. Mary joined the Caltech faculty in 1981, which was two years after I did. <laughs> Studies of central nervous systems and synapses and how memory is stored are what she works on, both through laboratory experiments and more recently through computer simulations. Dr. Kennedy is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has won the Ibsen Foundation Prize for studies on the role of synthetic synaptic proteins in neuronal plasticity. Her, top, her topic is neural plasticity, what it is and what it can do for you. Tonight I'm going to tell you about the property of the nervous system that's called neuroplasticity. Um, this term actually has many meanings. Um, it includes um, often sculpting of the nervous system during development and repair of the injured nervous system. But I'm going to focus instead on neuroplasticity as it applies to the function of the healthy adult brain. Over the last few decades, we've learned that the fine structure of the adult brain is far more adaptive to the experience of the individual um, than most people have realized. So, um, I'm first going to give you an overview of what I'll cover. Um, first, I'll show you an interesting example of how the adult brain is subtly reshaped by our daily activities. There have been many studies that um, show this phenomenon, but there's uh, one in particular that I think is kind of interesting, and I will uh, go over it in a little bit of detail. And then I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on a kind of microscopic tour through the fine structure of the, of the brain. <clears throat> my, my main goal tonight is to give you a visual picture of the structure of the brain at many uh, levels, from centimeters down to nanometers. And it will mostly be imagery, um, so don't worry about understanding it all. Um, the, I'll then uh, talk about tiny molecular machines at the synapses that regulate neuroplasticity. This is what I've worked on for the past uh, 30 years, and we've learned a great deal about them. And I'll end uh, by showing you some genetic evidence uh, that came out just over the last year or two that suggests that defects in this machinery, um, mutations in this machinery, can predispose individuals to develop mental disorders. So before I get into the substance of the talk, I want to acknowledge some of my lab members. These are members of the lab over the past 10 years or so, including some graduate students and postdocs and uh, staff people who've helped me with this work and uh, who I very much have appreciated working with. Um, more recently, we also have a, um, an ongoing and close collaboration with the lab of Terry Sanofsky at the Salk Institute in UCSD. Uh, Terry and his group, including Tom Bartol as the kind of leader, are uh, molecular model, modelers extraordinaire, and they've helped us a lot with our more recent work. Kristen Harris at Texas is probably the world's foremost 
electron microscopist of the brain, and I'll be showing you the results of some of her microscopy uh, later on. And Joel Stiles at Pittsburgh uh, has written computer programs that have been invaluable to us. So I want to uh, mention that the main funding for this work has been through the National Institutes of Health, which uh, is essentially uh, um, indispensable for doing uh, the kind of work that we do. Um, in addition, many individuals associated with, with Caltech and, and foundations have helped us along the way, um, including the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, which funds a Center for Integrative Study of Cell Regulation, which I direct, uh, the Della Martin Foundation, Alan and Lena Bell Davis, who, who fund my uh, professorial position, um, the Hereditary Disease Foundation, the, the CHDI Foundation, the Hicks Foundation, French Foundation for Alzheimer's Research, the Joyce Foundation, and uh, also NSF and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So we very much appreciate the support of these, uh, this variety of people over the years. So the study that I'm going to summarize for you uh, was done in uh, 1995 um, and published in Science Magazine by Edward Taub and his colleagues at University of Alabama and in Germany. Um, and they asked a very simple question, um, which is, uh, it was motivated actually by animal studies that were going on at the time uh, that suggested that the brain could reorganize itself in response to uh, training um, or manipulations of various kinds in the periphery of the animal. And they asked if, the, if simply if the representation of the fingers of the left hand in the cortex, and I'll show you what I mean by representation in a minute, they ask if those might be larger um, in musicians who play string instruments, given that uh, when you play a string instrument, the, the fingers and their ability to manipulate the, the strings to make notes are, is critical. Um, so they uh, use, to do this, they used a, 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 obviously a non-invasive device, a, a, a detector that can be fixed to the scalp and detects the uh, small dipole moments that, um, or, or basically small currents that are induced when a, a group of cortical neurons fires uh, synchronously. So the part of the brain that they studied was the somatosensory cortex, uh, shown here in red. Stop this minute. So, um, when I say the, the area of the brain that uh, represents the, the fingers of the left hand, um, I'm referring to the fact that uh, touch sensation from any part of the body uh, is transmitted um, through uh, subcortical structures to a part of the cortex, the overlaying uh, area, um, area of the brain. And this, this particular part of the cortex is the somatosensory cortex. It's just behind uh, the central sulcus, which can, is shown there. Um, and it, uh, stimulation of various parts of the body um, are organized, uh, are, are received by the cortex and organized into areas uh, that are often called an homunculus. Many of you may be familiar with that term. So uh, when you stimulate, for example, your lips or uh, your, hand, your arm or your hand, um, particular sets of neurons in, in stereotyped parts of the brain fire together, and that can be detected. Um, and so it goes from the pharynx and the tongue, through the teeth, through the lips, which have a large sensory representation. Um, the hand it has a, 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 an area of the cortex that's very large that represents sensation in the hand or fires during sensation in the hand uh, and so on. The uh, nearby motor cortex um, also has a homunculus uh, representation or homuncular representation such that uh, stimulation of particular parts of the cortex cause the muscles of the hand or of the face and so on to move. So uh, at, th at this very uh, gross level, the brain is highly organized, and that's already uh, a, a, uh, a form of brain structure that I want to introduce you to. So uh, what Taub and his colleagues did is place their sensors over the part of the brain um, that represents what they call D1 or the thumb, digit one is the thumb, or digit five, which is the little finger. 
um, and they asked how large the current was that was generated in their experimental group um, and, uh, and in their control group in both the left and the right hemispheres. The right hemisphere uh, carries the information of sti about stimulation of the, right, of the left hand, the one that they hypothesized would change. <clears throat> the left hemisphere carries information about the right hand. Uh, for their uh, subjects, the, the experimental subjects, they had six violinists, uh, three, um, ch two cellists, uh, and one guitarist. So they had nine subjects, and they chose controls from the, uh, the same population that were not musicians, um, and made similar measurements in their somatosensory cortex. So uh, this is a visual representation of what they found. Um, this is a, a, di a, a diagram of the surface of the brain with its sulci, its sulci and uh, gyruses. Here is the um, somatosensory cortex here. The yellow arrows represent the size and approximate location of the, the uh, currents generated in the control group when they stimulated with a little uh, vibrating, sense, uh, vibrating probe, when they stimulated either the thumb or the, the fifth digit. The green arrows represent the size and the approximate location um, in the, the experimental group, the musicians, uh, when they did the same sort of stimulation. Uh, and what you can see is that, it, two things actually, the location, the sort of center of the representation of D1 shifted what, what's uh, called medially toward the center of the brain and got a little bit bigger, or was a little bit bigger um, in the, the group of musicians compared to the control group. On the other hand, uh, the little finger, or digit five, had a much, much larger uh, cortical representation as detected by this uh, small current. Um, and it was also shifted quite a bit medially toward the center of the brain. Um, so on the, on the right side of the brain, representing the left hand, um, the representation of D5 was much bigger than the representation uh, in, the, in the experimental group than in the control group. On the other hand, in the, the left hemisphere, which represents the fingers of the other hand, the, the hand that works the bow, um, was not different between the two groups. Um, they, in, in looking at their data, interestingly enough, uh, they found one variable that affected the, 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 the um, or correlated with the size of the change uh, in the dipole moment, uh, and that was um, the age when the, the musicians began to practice or began to play. So, if uh, in their in their uh, control in their experimental group, um, there were five individuals that began uh, playing the instrument at the age of 13 or younger, <clears throat> and they had a much larger or a larger um, increase in the size of the dipole that indicated about twice as many neurons in the brain. Uh, representing the, the, the stimulation to the left hand. I should say that, that in the area of cortex that receives this stimulation, uh, thousands of neurons respond even in, in a normal individual, but twice as many neurons respond in this control group. On the other hand, in the individuals that had begun pl uh, practicing a little bit later or playing a little bit later, uh, there was still a, a highly significant increase, but it was less in magnitude. And then the con control group was clustered uh, together at this level. So um, there are two ways of interpreting, formally at least, um, results like this. One uh, is to say that maybe individuals who have uh, a bigger representation of the fingers of the left hand and their somatosensory cortex to begin with are drawn to playing string instruments because they're good at it. Um, and there isn't necessarily a cause and effect relationship and the other, another major interpretation is that uh, the long practice um, fingering the, the uh, strings with the left hand and, and having to learn very carefully uh, to sense the position of the fingers in order to get the, the notes right um, gradually increased the size of the representation of the fingers in the cortex. Um, there are a couple of reasons to, uh, at the, at, in 1995, to believe uh, the second interpretation, that, that the cortex had actually increased its representation of the, of the left hand. One is that there was not a difference between the control group and the musicians um, on the side of the cortex that represents the right hand. And so it's slightly more far-fetched to imagine 
that individuals that, for whatever reason, have uh, a bigger representation in the cortex of the le representing the left hand are drawn to play strings, but they don't have the same thing in the right hand. Um, but a more compelling argument is that a number of studies in animals uh, had already uh, indicated with um, more invasive techniques and more controlled techniques that, that training of different, uh, both uh, sensory training and auditory and, and visual training of different parts of uh, the body um, could increase the cortical representation uh, measured before and after, so they could show a cause and effect um, relationship. And this indicated that so, this, this particular experiment indicated that that cause and effect relationship uh, likely exists in humans as well. Um, since then, uh, people have studied, for example, individuals that are blind and learn to read Braille. And the representation of the um, right hand, uh, sens somatosensory representation of the right hand, is much larger in those individuals. So it's now uh, pretty well accepted that the brain can adapt the area of the cortex that it devotes to sensing a certain part of uh, uh, information at a certain part of the, of the body, can adapt that to uh, the, the, the um, behavior or the practice or the experience of the individual. So uh, to give you a sense for how this kind of adaptation uh, happens and what we've learned about it over the past couple of decades, um, I want to now take you on this tour uh, through the structure of the brain. And to do that, um, I'm going to use somewhat interchangeably uh, images from um, the human brain, which I've already done to a certain extent, the monkey brain, shown here, and then uh, later on the mouse brain. And I want to first indicate that uh, at the level of centimeters, um, these brains are extremely different in size. This won't surprise you too much. Um, however, um, if you look at the thickness of the overlying cell layer called the cerebral cortex, which is this uh, sh sort of scrunched up sheet in the human and somewhat less scrunched up sheet in the, in the, the uh, monkey and rather smooth and small sheet in the mouse, if you look at the thickness of this uh, cerebral cortex in the human, it's 2.5 to 4.5 millimeters depending on the area that you look at. In the monkey, it's on the order of uh, 1.5 to 2.5 millimeters, and in the mouse, it's about a millimeter. So the difference in size is much smaller. Um, at the level of individual neurons, there's not really much difference. The, the size of neurons in a mouse brain is about the same as the size of neurons in a human brain, as is much of their uh, uh, structural features. Um, so the, the big difference in the human brain, or one, one of the big differences, um, is that there are many, many more neurons. They're arranged in more complicated circuits, uh, and they, in, they, inter, uh, they uh, interact with each other or send signals to each other in a much more complicated and uh, elaborated way. So going now, actually, before I do that, I want to say the, the next slide is a um, series of sections that are taken at this plane through the monkey brain right about there, and they're, they're called um, coronal sections. And um, this takes us from centimeters down uh, to millimeters in looking at the structural organization of the brain. So this, this is the overlaying cerebral cortex uh, that I showed you the surface of a while, just a, uh, a while ago. Um, it's been stained with a stain called a nissel stain, which uh, turns the concentrations of ribonucleic acid a dark blue. And basically what that does is stain the, the cell bodies of neurons a very dark blue. And it allows one to see at this level of resolution the, the uh, patterns of concentration or organization of the, the neuronal cell bodies. Um, so you can see here at, the, at an area that's about two millimeters thick, you can see some dense bands. And here the, the band is thicker, and here it's a little bit thinner. Um, so that's the, or, the organization at the millimeter level. Um, if we look a little bit more closely, um, going from millimeters to about 500 microns down here on this scale bar, um, you see these individual neurons have a different organization in different parts 
um, of the, the monkey brain. The motor cortex is a bit thicker, and the concentrations of neurons are not quite so evident, but there are very big projection, uh, what we call projection neurons in layer five. Uh, the association cortex is an area that receives sensory information from many different uh, modalities, vision, auditory. Uh, and you can see that the concentrations of neurons are slightly different from the visual cortex, which has these very, very uh, tight bands of neurons separated by less dense uh, areas um, in, in layer uh, four and layer uh, two and three. Um, so there is, there is an organization uh, at the level of microns, hundreds of microns, um, that, that distinguishes different uh, parts of the visual cortex, so, or di different parts of the cerebral cortex. Um, in the somatosensory cortex, uh, which was recorded from in the experiment that I told you about, the sensors would have been placed over the top of the, of the, the skull, and they would have been recording the firing of neurons in an area just about this big, millimeters to a couple millimeters in diameter. So there's thousands of neurons in that uh, um, column of neurons in the cortex. And I'm gonna show you uh, uh, increasingly a little bit more about how they're organized at the structural level uh, and what changes when you change, uh, when neuroplasticity happens. Um, so before, I show you a video that takes us through a section of a brain. I just want to make um, uh, a, a very simple point about the nissel stained sections that I've just shown you. You saw a bunch of dots that represent the concentrations of uh, neuronal cell bodies in the cerebral cortex. What those dots really look like, um, if the neurons are stained with a different stain that stains the entire uh, um, area of the neuron with all its projections uh, is shown here uh, on the right. You have concentrations of pyramidal neurons here and here. And you can see that those neurons, uh, most of them, have a, 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 what's called an apical dendrite, a long extension that often reaches way up to area one or to layer one and then branches out. So these somas that are stained with the nissel stain or cell bodies that are stained with the nissel stain um, are the centers of long, thin projections that receive, neuron, receive synapses from many different uh, parts of the brain and, or, or their neighbors. Uh, in addition, um, the, the pyramidal neurons have long axons uh, that often extend down to the white matter and sometimes go through the white matter to entirely different parts of the cortex. You can also see these branches of uh, dendrites that occur in the, in the uh, in the area of the soma. So the point I wanna make is that every one of these neurons both makes and receives thousands of synapses. And that's what this diagram is meant to show. Um, in the pictures you'll see, it won't be so obvious where the synapses are coming from, that you'll see lots and lots of dots which represent synapses, but they're all coming from a neuron uh, somewhere else somewhere, in the, in either in the structure of the, of the cortex you're looking at or in a neighboring structure. What's different about uh, each of these synapses is their size and the strength that they have in, the, in their ability to, to uh, fire um, the, the next neuron in line. Synaptic or neuronal plasticity really has to do with changing the strength of synapses between one neuron and another uh, in such a way that the, the, for example, in, the, in our experiment, in such a way that stimulation of the finger um, of uh, one of the subjects <clears throat> simply fires more neurons. There are more, there are more synapses uh, onto uh, the next neurons in line that are strong and big uh, and um, meant to fire the neuron than there were before, uh, before the, the individual started practicing. That's called synaptic plasticity, and I'll come back to that again and again. <clears throat> but each, each neuron, none, nonetheless, makes and receives thousands of synapses, most of which are quite small and don't have a strong influence on the, the, uh, neuron, the next neuron in line. Okay, so uh, this is a, uh, a section that I want to just talk you through a little bit to prepare you for a video uh, that was made of a sort of a tour through this stained section of a mouse somatosensory cortex. 
that gives, I think, a, a, as you'll see, a wonderful picture of the, the, the fine structure, the fine organization within these layers of the cortex. This is just for your reference, a nissel stained somatosensory cortex now from the mouse. It has its, the six layers that they all have. Um, and here's, uh, in, in the um, section that you'll see in the video, uh, the neurons have been stained uh, with, a, with fluorescent stains that represent three different aspects of the structure um, of the, the, sec the, the uh, section through the somatosensory cortex. Um, about a tenth of the neurons in layer five have been uh, filled uh, by a genetic manipulation with a, a green fluorescent protein that fills their entire structure and shows uh, the somas of these neurons. And here you can see one uh, dendrite extending all the way up to layer one. And when you see it at high power, you'll see that there are synapses made all along this dendrite. Um, and at higher power, you'll also see that the, the uh, axons of these individual neurons in green coming down, gathering here at the white matter uh, and taking off for some of them for some other, uh, to make contact either with lower structures or with another part of the cortex. <clears throat> in addition, these sections have been stained with a protein that's very, uh, stained red by staining for a protein that's very concentrated in the presynaptic terminals uh, that make synapses. And they look, it looks here just like sort of a red background. When you see it at high power, you'll see thousands of dots that are the synapses made on the, the dendrites in this area. Also at higher power, you'll see that they've used a blue stain to stain uh, many of the dendrites that are not labeled of other cell bodies that are not labeled in green. I think you can see it here, but you'll see it much better in the video I'm about to show you. There are many, many neurons, um, neuronal cell bodies in this section that are not stained, and they look like little holes here, little lacunae. So the point of this video is, to, is just to sort of relax and enjoy it and, and get a feeling for the complexity of the structure, even of the mouse somatosensory cortex and the way that it's organized uh, at the micron level. So he's zooming in now to higher power. You can see that up here. This is, this is the field you're looking at. There's the blue showing the other dendrites. All these thousands of little synapses being made. As you move down. You can see a dendrite here and these little protuberances I'll be talking about later are called spines. So we've only gone a little way into layer two, three, and you see all this, the many, many synapses. You can see the, I hope, the, uh, the holes where all the other neuronal cell bodies are located. And now you see branching dendrites coming from the big layer five neurons, all kinds of branches in this particular part of the cortex. And as he zooms in, you see more synapses. Now in layer 5a, there are dense, dense synapses made onto these, uh, the, the dendrites of the layer 5 neurons. Thousands and thousands of them. Now you'll see the somas of the layer 5 neurons. And you can see how thickly their dendrites branch. Here's some other unstained neuronal cell bodies. Some of these long processes now are axons, which are carrying the the electrical information onto the other neurons. 
You see again a field of very, very dense synapses. One lone displaced neuron. We're getting down near the white matter now. You can see some of the axons converging and running in this direction. These are thick myelinated axons that carry signals a long, long way. Now we're getting into the striatum. The striatum is sometimes called the basal ganglia. This is the subcortical part of the brain that's uh, damaged in, in Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease, and it's thick with synapses. So now we're near the end. So that's from Stephen Smith in his lab at Stanford. And I think it gives a beautiful sense of the, the uh, complexity of the structure at the, at the micron level um, of the brain. So now we're going to go down to the nanometer level, getting a little bit closer to, to uh, synapses. This is, this is one little piece um, from the video that you just saw. And this is a two micron marker. So each of the, the uh, Dendrites of these neurons is about two microns in diameter. Uh, and uh, he, this is a projection rendering. It's the rendering that you saw in the video. Um, it's possible to take, uh, to reconstruct through several sections and, and make what's called a volume rendering of this, of a similar dendritic segment <clears throat> that looks like this. So the dendrites actually have along them thousands and thousands of these little protuberances, membrane protuberances that are called spines. Each of those makes a synapse, and you'll see this in the next uh, movie that I show, how the, how the spines contact axons that are running thickly through this uh, part, this, this segment of the brain. Each one of the, of the spines uh, has a, an axon that contacts it and makes a synapse. The bigger spines are stronger synapses um, because they have more uh, area, they have more receptors, and so they, make, they depolarize the dendrite uh, more strongly. And here's an example of one fairly large single spine from this uh, dendrite. Um, and you'll see that it's 500, uh, uh, this is a 500 nanometer marker. Um, so these spines are very tiny and uh, it, the diameter of a typical protein is on the order of 10 nanometers, 5 nanometers. So uh, you can count the number of proteins that are in this, this uh, small a segment um, of an individual neuron. Um, so first, before I show you the, the reconstruction uh, video that I'm, I will show you next of a, of a group of dendrites, um, I want to show you an electron micrograph um, that is a section through one synapse. Um, here's, an, again, a 500 nanometer uh, marker, one synapse in um, a typical cortical, or uh, in this case it was hippocampal, but a cortical uh, synapse would look quite similar. So electron, the electron microscope is a microscope in, um, uh, it, that takes pictures um, at a much higher resolution than a fluorescence light microscope can. The tissue is infused, first fixed, then infused with plastic, and then cut it very, very thin, into very, very thin sections on the order of nanometers. Uh, thin, and uh, so you can see structures that are, are that contain just a, a, a very small group of proteins. In a presynaptic terminal shown here, this is kind of a key. Um, inside the terminal, you can see little circles that are kind of like balloons, little tiny balloons, and they they um, contain in them 
small transmitter molecules. In this case, the transmitter molecule is glutamate. That's the excitatory transmitter molecule uh, in the brain. And when an action potential invades this presynaptic terminal, um, each one or, or two of these little balloons fuse with the, with the uh, membrane here and release their glutamate into this space, which is called the synaptic cleft. Um, if you look in the dictionary, it will say that the synapse is actually this cleft. Um, those of us who study synapses don't think of that as the synapse. The synapse is this entire structure. This is the synaptic cleft. And the transmitter is released into the cleft, it diffuses across, it binds to proteins in the postsynaptic spine, um, receptors for that glutamate, which open little channels that let ions flow through and depolarize the membrane. Um, a structure that you can see quite prominently in this electron micrograph is the postsynaptic density. It's a thickening of the membrane of the spine at the postsynaptic site where the vesicles are clustered up to release their glutamate. It's often just called the PSD. Um, the postsynaptic density is, is the structure that I've worked on for many, many years, and, and we've, over the years, along with maybe 10 or 15 other labs in the world, um, have identified the proteins that are present in this thick, proteinaceous structure, and they're signaling molecules, uh, enzymes, that are activated by calcium that flows into the spine when it's active. And those signaling molecules are what trigger the uh, changes that are called synaptic plasticity. They really uh, control it. Um, so I'm going to first show you a, a video, which is a reconstruction at this level of detail of the, the membrane of a five micron by uh, six micron by six micron little cube from the, the, a, a section like the one that you just saw. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you, the, what this reconstruction uh, will show you is how much uh, material is packed into this tiny uh, little cube that it contains about 100 cubic microns. And I hope we'll give you a better picture, picture of the fine structure of dendrites and synapses. So this was made by my collaborators um, at the, the Salk, and they call it a waltz, and you'll see why in a minute. This is the people who worked on the film. So this is the, the uh, major dendrite that you'll see uh, running through this uh, 180 cubic micron piece of neuropil. And it's the first one that they'll give you um, a feeling for, but then they'll show you all the other structures that are located there. So uh, there you'll see it. That's the major dendrite. Um, it has 77 spines, and it receives input from 69 different little pieces of axons. You could turn that up a little. <laughs> so the red is, are the postsynaptic densities, and now you see the synapses, I mean, the, the axons coming in, the little strips of axons in this section that contact each of those spines. So there are 69 of these axons contacting 77 spines. This is a single astrocyte with a lot of different uh, projections that, that envelops and wraps around uh, the, the um, synapses and the dendrite, as you'll see in a minute. They're actually going to reconstruct the entire cube gradually. So this is just one dendrite that is in this tiny little cube that would fit inside a red blood cell. Now we're going to go inside that dendrite, uh, and this shows some of the internal membranes that are present inside the dendrite. The, the, the long purple structures are mitochondria, which some of you may have heard of. That's the energy-producing um, subcellular organelle of the neuron. They're long, long, thin mitochondria, and the other, the, the uh, turquoise membranes are sort of support structures that keep the axon, or excuse me, keep the dendrite, uh, keep its integrity. Now we're going to go into the neck of one spine, 
Now, this spine, it looks, it, it's, is empty because the internal contents have not been reconstructed in this particular representation. It's just to give you a sense of the volume, I guess. This is the postsynaptic density, just shown as a red thing. Now we're outside again. And we're just showing a few of the axons and the astrocytes and their relationship to the uh, axons. So in a second, uh, after they waltz you through this for a while, um, they're going to begin to build, build uh, the structures that are in the entire cube. And there are 477 axon segments, 450 synapses, um, 150 pieces of dendrites, uh, and one astrocyte. So that's the, this, is, this shows you the density of uh, synaptic contacts in a, in a structure like the one that, uh, that you just saw in the earlier video. There are only a few axons there now to give you a sense of, so there's a synapse surrounded by an astrocyte. Okay, now we'll start filling it in again. You can tell how much they enjoy this kind of work. Okay, here come the other axons. Oops, the other dendrites. So you can see how much is packed into this tiny little cube. Now that here come the axons, just hundreds of them. So there's the cube. 447 axon segments in that tiny little piece that would fit inside a red blood cell. One of the major challenges in neuroscience uh, these days is to understand uh, in this kind of dense packing what the actual circuitry is between one part of the brain and another. You can imagine that it's a pretty difficult circuit tracing problem. Okay, we're almost done. There's all the synapses, 450 of them, and their relationship to the astrocytes. Oh, this is now all the synaptic clefts, I should say. And here come the dendrites. Now we're back to that original major dendrite running right through the middle. Okay, so that's how the brain uh, is put together down at the uh, hundreds of nanometers level. And what I'm going to do Next is come back to the issue of, of uh, neuronal plasticity and synaptic plasticity. Um, and I first want to go into a little bit more detail about what happens at the molecular and, and subcellular level when a synapse is strengthened by activity um, or, or when synaptic plas plasticity occurs, which underlies the neural plasticity that I've shown you so far. Um, Depending on the pattern of activity and the pattern of glutamate release in a synapse, um, a specialized set of receptors called NMDA receptors, you don't really need to remember that, a specialized set of receptors um, are activated uh, and allow calcium to flow um, into the spine uh, but in, in a fluctuating pattern. So it fluxes in, gets pumped out by active pumps, fluxes in, gets pumped out at different frequencies and in different amounts. Um, depending on those frequencies and those amounts, 
um, the enzymes in the postsynaptic density that I'm about to show you a picture of uh, make start to, to make changes that really restructure the synapse and make it bigger. The, the uh, cytoskeleton, the actin cytoskeleton of the spine becomes much more branched and bigger so that it supports a larger structure. Uh, and um, glutamate receptors, additional glutamate receptors, are added into the membrane by a process called endocytosis. Um, in response, the presynaptic terminal actually enlarges uh, gradually um, more, recept more uh, vesicles cluster there and more release sites um, are added uh, at the presynaptic uh, side. And so the synapse gradually becomes bigger. But this process is initiated in the postsynaptic density by the flux of calcium that comes through the specialized little receptors um, called NMDA receptors. Um, so I'm going to show you uh, the, the uh, approximate size and arrangement of some of these proteins um, in the, uh, by using the electron micrograph that I showed you earlier. So we'll zoom in um, to this one synapse, and now we'll zoom in to that postsynaptic density, and you'll see with this special color electron microscope, um, it's not a color electron microscope, <laughs> Uh, in this blow up of a 450 nanometer postsynaptic density, I've placed the um, X ray structures of NMDA receptors here shown in blue, AMPA receptors. Uh, th th these are the, the, uh, another class of glutamate receptors that just depolarize the membrane, these little red ones. Um, and I hope you can see it. It's, it's when it projects this big, it sort of fades out a little bit. There are a series of scaffold proteins in yellow here that hold together um, the, the receptors with several uh, regulatory enzymes. Um, this one is called CAM kinase 2, and I'll show you a much bigger picture of it in a minute. Here's a little one called SYNGAP, and that is important for reasons that I will tell you in a minute. Um, and there is also a scaffold molecule called PSD95, which tends to run this way and interact with the molecules that run this way to hold the entire structure together. Um, we've reached the point now, after about 20 years of work by various labs, where we know we think we know most of the proteins that are present at the postsynaptic density and make up the signaling uh, cascades that initiate synaptic plasticity. This is just to give you an idea um, of how they fit into the electron uh, micrographs that I've been showing you. Um, those of you who think about um, mathematical modeling will know that this is such a small number of molecules, a countable number of molecules, <clears throat> that one can't use the, the usual deterministic modeling methods to understand kinetically how these, these pieces of machinery actually work. Uh, you, you have to use probabilistic or stochastic modeling, and what we're doing with the Sanowski lab now is, is uh, using our knowledge, our test tube knowledge of how these molecules work to build such stochastic models and try to understand how the, the subtle differences in calcium flux um, lead to either strengthen synapses or sometimes actually lead uh, to weaken synapses. And I'll go over that uh, issue on the next slide. So this is a, a, a similar representation, but much larger. The colors are a little different. I apologize. Here again, we have NMDA receptors, AMPA receptors, SYNGAP, this molecule called CAM kinase 2, a really central uh, calcium responder. You can get a clue when, a when an enzyme responds to calcium influx by the CA at the beginning of its name. Um, here are the scaffold molecules that hold these, uh, these structures together and orient them so that their uh, rates of interaction are appropriate. Here's PSD95, which is the major scaffold. So to, to um, tell you in a very simplified way, uh, how, how these reactions progress. I can tell you that when calcium flows through the channel of the NMDA receptor, and I'm going to show you a little simulation of that in a minute, um, if CAM kinase 2 is there close enough to, to uh, be activated by that calcium, um, it interacts with, it's activated and interacts with this molecule called SYNGAP. You don't have to know what its enzymatic activity is. Syngap kicks off a cascade of reactions represented by this, this dashed line, and more amper receptors get added 
to the membrane as a result. At the same time, and I haven't shown it here, the cytoskeleton is rearranged so that the synapse is bigger. On the other hand, if the pattern of calcium influx um, is a little bit different, it can happen that this molecule called cal calcineurin is more activated than, than uh, CAM kinase. Calcineurin actually can reverse some of the action on Syngap and therefore downregulate this cascade and lead to the endocytosis or removal of AMPA receptors from the synapse and weaken the synapse. So the, cal the, the exact pattern of calcium flux into the synapse is what controls whether it strengthens or whether it weakens. Um, if you can't exactly understand how that might work, don't worry about it because nobody knows how that works at this point. Th this is what we're trying to find out. It's really a very delicate regulation by, by one uh, small calcium ion. Uh, and we think we need to do this stochastic modeling to understand the competition between uh, the two different proteins. Um, so this is the last visualization, and I'm going to use it to show you, actually I'm going to step through it a little more slowly, um, to show you what I mean by the fluctuating uh, calcium into the spine. Um, I'm going to go a little bit further here. Oops. Didn't want that to happen yet. <laughs> That's release of glutamate. Okay, so you don't see the presynaptic terminal here. What you do see is at the, on the surface of the, the uh, postsynaptic spine, you see these little green things. These are AMPA receptors. You can't see them very well, I don't think, in this blow up, but there are, and you'll see them better once they're activated, but there are little blue receptors here. Those are the NMDA receptors. Those are the, the receptors that um, activate with very different kinetics and allow calcium to flow in. Um, now I'm going to step through the release of uh, glutamate there. We have, it's very fast. Down here is, is oops, milliseconds. So this is on the microsecond scale. So you see the glutamate released. And when the smoke kind of clears, you see even, even before one millisecond has gone by, um, some of these AMPA receptors have bound two glutamate uh, molecules. This is a simulation, so this really is uh, a, a probabilistic uh, representation of what we think actually happens. Um, and these AMPA receptors have opened and begun to depolarize this terminal a little bit. The lighter blue NMDA receptors have bound one or two glutamates, but they haven't opened yet because they have a much slower uh, kinetic um, process of opening. And I'm going to let it run now for a little while, and we'll get to the point where some of the NMDA receptors start to open, and I'll stop it again. But you can see changes in the AMPA receptors as they flicker on and off, the, the yellow receptors. Now, as we get toward one millisecond here, um, we'll get close to where one of the NMDA receptors becomes activated, and we'll it, they, they have turned the simulation so we can actually see it. Okay, so what you'll see uh, soon is that this NMDA receptor turns white, which means it's opened and calcium will start to flow in. So the little white dots that you see here and there inside uh, the, the synaptic spine um, are free calcium ions. They're a representation of free calcium ions. They're actually, the glyph that's used to represent them is much bigger than calcium, but you have to be able to see it or it doesn't do you much good. Um, the, there isn't very much free calcium ion at all at baseline in a spine because most of it, there's lots of calcium there, but most of it is bound to proteins. Um, the, we've, what we've done here is simulate the free calcium as a sort of proxy for the total calcium that flows like mad through the open NMDA receptors, and you'll see that in a minute. Um, so you, so you, aren't, you are seeing individual calcium ions, but you're seeing only the free ones, and there are lots more that come in and get immediately bound up or else get pumped out of the spine um, by the, the uh, pumps whose job it is to do that. Okay. So soon this, there, we, he's turned white, and you can see free calcium starting to build up. And as it builds up at this very short time scale, less than two milliseconds, what you notice is that it's, it's, uh, the, the total calcium and the free calcium are much more concentrated right near the receptor, which is where the postsynaptic density is. Um, so part of the, the uh, tight control of the response of this regulatory 
machinery um, to uh, calcium and the NMDA receptor has to do with the, the actual location um, uh, where, where these enzymes are held with respect to the, the NMDA receptor. So this goes on for a while, and you'll see it close. So the NMDA receptor flickers a lot. It opens and closes, uh, and, and the flickering to, depends to a certain extent on how often the presynaptic terminal releases glutamate. Here it's only released it once. There it flickered on again, a little bit more came in. And it'll flicker open in, in a minute, and you'll see just, again, calcium just pouring in and building up in this location here. Uh, where the postsynaptic density enzymes are located. This goes on and on, and I'll stop it in just a minute. But hopefully you get the idea. Okay, so depending on the, the, the uh, magnitude and the, the frequency of that calcium flux through NMDA receptors, as I mentioned before, you either get more activation of CAM kinase 2 um, and, and uh, more receptors added to the membrane, um, or you get more activation of calcineurin, and some of those receptors get removed. Um, this is at the core of what happens during neural plasticity, this very delicate calcium regulation. Now, um, I'm going to finish by saying that um, when I started here 30 years ago, um, we didn't know any of the molecules in the postsynaptic density, none of them. We knew it as a, as, as a dark thing that you saw in the electron microscope. Um, now we know most of the, of the proteins that are there, and we know quite a bit about how they work and how they respond to calcium. <clears throat> so we've made a lot of progress um, in understanding this aspect of brain function. At the same time, as many of you are probably aware, um, the, the uh, genomes of um, humans and many other organisms have been sequenced completely and mapped, um, mapped meaning little pieces of nucleotides that can identify one part or another of the genome have been put in banks and can be used routinely in the laboratory. Um, so one major project that's gone on recently is called GWAS studies. This means genome-wide association studies. Um, these are studies in which large uh, uh, collaborations of uh, mostly medical people and geneticists, uh, as, um, assemble families um, of patients, um, for example, a family in which uh, schizophrenia is much more common than normal, or a family in which autism is much more common than normal. Um, and they look at the genomes of these families and, and try to see in the affected individuals uh, what is different, what is, cons what is consistently different in their genome compared to individuals who are not affected. So these are attempts to understand what mutations um, might be uh, predisposing um, individuals to mental illnesses of various kinds. These same kinds of studies are going on for heart disease and lots of other diseases. Um, I should say that on the whole, the, the, the GWAS studies, some, the, the results of which uh, have come out over the, just the last year or two, um, the GWAS studies for mental illnesses have been somewhat disappointing in that there are many genes that seem to predispose uh, to mental illness. None of them is a major uh, predisposer. There are lots of little ones, but um, among them um, are several already, uh, several of the proteins that I've just shown you. The, the, the uh, Syngap that I showed you, PSD95, and Shank, two of the uh, scaffold proteins <clears throat> in the postsynaptic density, uh, seem to predispose or, or, or uh, influence a risk for autism spectrum disorders. Um, neurogranin and PSD93, PSD93 is a scaffold molecule. Neurogranin is a, a, a synaptic protein I haven't talked about. Um, it is a regulator of the calcium balance at the synapse. And it's a, it's a, has come out as a rather rather more, one of the more prominent risk factors for uh, schizophrenia uh, in the genome. And um, finally, I'll just mention that an autosomal non, uh, in studies of autosomal non-syndromic mental retardation, what does that mean? Uh, it means um, mental retardation that comes from a mutation and that is not accompanied by any other physical symptoms. The, the individual, um, so it's not, it's not a big uh, um, 
deletion of part of a chromosome so that the individual has many other symptoms. It's simply a, a, a severe cognitive deficit. Um, a study in, in, in Britain of families of individuals, actually, who had autosomal non-syndromic mental retardation found that 6% of the patients had um, mutations in Syngap, this protein that I showed you, whereas the controls had none. So uh, the, the, the point is that the molecules that we've been able to identify in this long study of how the synapse works um, are beginning to come out of genetic studies um, that are asking what are the risk factors uh, for, for mental illnesses. Um, where most of us think this is going, or what, what this will eventually result in, is, is the ability to understand the pathways that go awry um, when an individual develops a mental illness. Ultimately, in the fullness of time, um, that should enable pharmaceutical companies to make much better drugs than are available now. Um, this kind of work is expensive, and it's long, and it's hard, um, and it looks to the general population as though not much progress has been made, but the fact is a lot of progress has been made. And we think we're handing the next generation information upon which they hopefully uh, can build and perhaps begin to actually treat some of these rather devastating disorders. So I'll just once again point out these little molecules that have been found uh, to perhaps contribute to risk for mental uh, diseases. And uh, with that, I'll stop and take questions. <laughs>